10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. MDS, we have ignition, we have a liftoff. Roll program is in on time, vehicle response is normal. PVC bus, water to good, tank pressure to good. Hey, MDS. Engine program was in on time, vehicle response was normal also. I love strategy games. They're hands down my favorite genre and have been for most of my life. I can't really put a finger on why. Maybe it's because of the challenge of figuring out how to outwit and force an opponent into submission. Or maybe it's because I'm a power hungry, closeted egomaniac who just wants the tiny people of imaginary worlds to squirm under my boot. I don't know, it's probably somewhere in between those two things. But whether I'm planted at a computer desk or sitting across a table looking my opponent in the eyes, these are games that really get my adrenaline running. Hey, you know what else gets my adrenaline running? SPACE! There's hardly anything in existence that can both match the intimidating mystery and wonderful vastness that is our universe. There's a reason why space has been a setting in fictional work since ancient Greece. The sheer amount of discovery and challenges that await humanity if we ever manage to truly break out into the infinite cosmos is beyond anything we could ever possibly imagine or dream up. Now, combine space as a setting with the strategy game genre, and you have a match made in heaven. How could you go wrong? And, in my opinion, at the top of this niche subgenre pyramid, there's one game that stands chief among them. Enter Paradox Interactive. While my feelings on them as a company are overall pretty mixed, I can't deny, they make some damn fine games. If you buy all the fucking DLC, that is. I have more hours on Victoria 2 and Hearts of Iron 4 than anyone in the world has any business investing into those games with. Come on, let's be honest, no one genuinely enjoys Hoi 4. That's a game you exclusively hate play. I dread the day I meet someone who actually savors their time in Hoi 4. That's a very scary person to imagine. This is coming from someone who unironically likes playing as Lithuania. Or hate likes, I guess. But cursing the world with the dreadful invention of the Danish-Lithuanian lie aside, I suppose the company has earned a few points of redemption after all. Because at the end of the day, they did make my favorite game of all time. That being Holocaust Simulate- no, 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 wait, wait. Right. Ultimate Racist Supreme- no, 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 wait, wait, um... Stellaris, Stellaris, that's right. I've honestly just been staring at my computer screen and my notes for hours, thinking about how exactly I want to structure this video. If you've never played Stellaris before, you might be curious as to why that is. Well, a full game of Stellaris can potentially last for weeks at a time. Not mere days like a lot of strategy games do, I mean literal weeks. 
and whenever you're not playing it, all that'll be on your mind is a war or diplomatic play you left unfinished. This is a game that can cover upwards of a millennia of galactic history, and despite its completely nonsensical and completely imaginary setting, it feels like a true-to-life historical sim. The nature of how civilizations go about policy-making, diplomacy, warfare, and expansion will change slowly, but ultimately drastically as the game progresses. Simply put, the first century of a Solaris playthrough feels like an entirely different game than the last century, which is a feeling that, for me anyway, feels exceptionally rare in many strategy games. So I decided that I'm going to try my best in discussing Stellaris, not solely by the nature of its game mechanics or design, but how a game of Stellaris feels to play through by stages, from its early game to its mid game to its late game, and the events that tend to transpire within these stages of play. Honestly, with how much there is to Stellaris in terms of functionality, provided that you buy the DLC that is, I feel like it's the only cohesive way I can best describe my thoughts on Solaris without getting lost or fumbling my words, which also means there's probably going to be a decent amount of features I won't talk about much. Hopefully that won't matter a ton. Also, hopefully this whole thing will make sense when I read over it later. Pro probably not, though. The very first thing you're confronted with when starting a new game of Stellaris is a civilization selection screen. Of course, all these options are retarded and no one who is mentally sane would ever think of playing as them. Well, except for the Earth Nazis, those guys are cool. No. This right here. This is what you really want to see. When creating a civilization, pretty much everything is customizable about who they are, where they come from, what their culture and values are, and the morality of their government. Which, as you can imagine, can lead to some pretty wacky and zany scenarios. Whether it be an empire of hive mind fungaloids who worship a big tree, a democratic political powerhouse that can sway half the galaxy to like them through friendly ethics, democracy is non negotiable, a race of zealous birds who do nothing but wage war and glass conquered planets or, you know, just, just Space Rome. I think the devs absolutely knew a lot of people were going to do Space Rome, because Latin names are one of the default name presets for humans. This, despite the fact that Space Athens is obviously the superior civilization and will always beat Space Rome. Me personally, I hate playing Democratic. I always play Imperial, or start off as dictatorial and eventually proclaim an empire when enough time goes by, because, you know, I'm a filthy fucking LARPer who likes doing dumb historical stuff like that. Want to know why I prefer imperial governments? Because democracy sucks. The more democratic your government is, the less things you can do, meaning less fun. But before you can have any government, you require living things that need to be oppressed in the first place. And there's no, no shortage, shortage of volunteers. volunteers. Several different species exist to choose from, with many varying phenotypes among them. With humanoids, there are humans, of course. And there are literal Scottish people. Mr. Leonard Spock from that one fish game, and many other interesting choices that have absolutely zero chance of ever being chosen by me. This dude fucks. There are also more animal and plant-derived species like avians, mammalians, that hot fish dude from Zelda, Groot from FreeMarvelMovies.com, and my favorite, Mushroom Man. You were beaten by a person who chose to put Mushroom Man in their deck. That's how bad you sucked. Generally speaking, not much in terms of gameplay drastically changes by selecting any particular species, except for some different traits and certain in-game decisions that can be unlocked over time. An example being that when a lithoid species species is switched to an undesirable species, you have the option to actually just literally melt them down into minerals, as opposed to slaughtering them and making food resources like with other species. Yes, by the way, genocide exists in Stellaris. Yes, I will explain more about it later, and yes, there is enough nuance to it to warrant elaboration. No, where the main draw for your species lies is in the traits you've assigned to them. Are they skilled warriors or are they skilled politicians? Are they skilled artisans or merchants? Do they like to migrate or stay in one place? Are they lazy or do they work too hard? What kind of planets do they have an easier time living on? Ocean? Desert? Forested? A fish species that doesn't even live in the water? The corn? <laughs> More like the Quran, honestly. Their origin is also quite important for your plans. 
The standard origin option is Prosperous Unification, where your starting planet starts off as a peaceful, single, unified state ready to explore space with no obstacles. But there are also origin options for being subject to an already existing spacefaring civilization, sharing your world with a subservient intelligent species, or even starting off right next to a semi-primitive civilization that might cause conflict with you at some point. And once you have your ultimate alien or superior version of humanity finalized, you can then create the government they'll be forced yeah, to pledge their America. lives to. Governments in Stellaris are built upon two things, ethics and civics. Ethics are the philosophies your civilization is based upon, the way it thinks and views the galaxy it's located in, each one having a relevant opposing ethic. Egalitarian versus authoritarian, militaristic versus pacifist, materialist v spiritualist, and the funny pair, xenophile versus xenophobic. By default, you can choose three of these eight ethics to be moderate in, or you can choose two while being fanatical in one and moderate in the other. Of these ethics, the two that will probably most affect the way other civs see you are the xeno-related ethics. Civs that are xenophilic have a massive advantage in establishing and improving good relations with most other species of aliens, which can be good if you're not planning on focusing too heavily on building up and maintaining a huge military in the early game. And if your ultimate goal is to secure a good diplomatic position in the galaxy by just making other alien races like you, and maybe eventually heading a powerful federation with a bunch of member civs which would make you the de facto galactic power. Pretty much the only people who wouldn't like you are alien civs with the xenophobic ethic. Speaking of which, the xenophobic trait also provides pretty good buffs for the early game. Namely in regards to expansion, the xenophobic ethic gives you a nice discount for constructing star bases and unclaimed solar systems. So xenophobic civs can potentially grab much more territory before encountering too many other alien empires. They also get a few additional small things, such as exclusive access to the galactic slave indentured servitude market, and their fleets also having access to the Armageddon orbital bombardment option. So if your aim in a war isn't to conquer colonies, but instead to destroy them, it'll be much faster to destroy the population of the planet. Or if you're feeling particularly covenant-like, much faster to glass them and render the worlds uninhabitable. The downside to this trade, of course, being that everyone around you will fucking hate you. Even other xenophobic aliens will hate you, and in order to be even a little bit okayish with another empire, you pretty much have to dedicate every diplomatic asset you have to just improving their opinion of you. And even then, it's not like they'll be friends with you, they'll just be less likely to invade you. So yeah, xenophobic, it's pretty cool, and it can help you straight up Conan the fucking galaxy. But you better be militarily on guard pretty much at all times. Definitely max out the fleet limit as early as possible and race for military tech whenever you can. On Honestly, the other ethics are cool too, but they don't affect the player as much in the early game as the Xeno ethics do, and are more part of a long-term vision. Helping with things such as gaining and preserving unity and influence, improving worker output, and even outlawing the production of robot workers. But while ethics may be the philosophy of your government, civics are the culture of your society. Depending on the traits of your species and the ethics you select, certain civics will be locked and unlocked to match the tendencies of your people. Some offer only good bonuses, while others offer drastic bonuses along with some negative side effects. There are civics that offer bonuses in industry and agriculture, give power to your aristocracy or the peasantry, promote military, bureaucratic, or civilian culture, or promote a more centralized or more feudal-like hierarchy, as well as more specialized options related to things like religious zeal or slave trading. Once you finalize your government and societal standards, you can name your empire and design your flag, completing your civilization, beginning your, hopefully, long history of exploring and conquering the great final frontier in a strange new galaxy. Regardless of whatever it is your civilization turns out to be, the very start of the game will tend to fundamentally be the same every time. You are alone. You don't know of anyone else's existence, or if there may even be any forms of life anywhere. You have no colonies. Your elementary at best level fleet is small, primitive, and has no experience. All you have that's of any use is a science ship 
equipped with a newly invented FTL drive and a single shipyard to build more of these special ships at. What I find actually kind of funny about this is the implication that literal faster than light speed travel is easier to obtain tech than a colony on Mars. I guess Musk buying out Twitter had greater implications than we previously thought. So it's very likely that when starting a new game, exploration will be a top priority in the player's mind, sending out science ships to survey and scout out neighboring stars. You may have already noticed these grayish lines between systems. These lines are referred to as hyperlanes, points of linear travel through empty space between stars. Each star, of course, has a number of planets orbiting around them, all of them waiting to be surveyed by your teams of scientists. Once a star system has been completely surveyed, that's when you're given the opportunity to possibly claim it as your own. Simply by building a star base within a system, it'll automatically be incorporated into your civilization's territory. It doesn't even need to share a hyperlane with another one of your systems, though in those cases it'll be more expensive to build. You may have noticed already that not all hyperlane routes are created equal. Many star systems will be connected adjacently to three or four or more other star systems. Quite often, chunks of these systems will be connected to other chunks of systems by single choke point star systems. Meaning that if a civilization hypothetically managed to build star bases in these positions, they would also automatically claim by de facto all the systems closed off by grabbing said choke point stars. And thus, this will be, for players at least because the AI really sucks, the very first objective of the game, race and encircle and incorporate as many star systems as possible. But what exactly is the purpose of owning a star system, aside from just painting the map with a very ugly yet also very oddly sexy border gore? Well, that's kind of a dumb question when you think about it. Why don't you just think for a minute? At the start of each game, every star system will have a random assortment and quantity of resources spawned within it, originating from the actual star or stars themselves with, say, energy credits or research points, or from the planets and moons that may be within them. Typically, those resources will be minerals, alloys, or even unity on occasion, and also rare resources such as rare crystals or motes or dark matter from black hole systems. By the end of the early stages of the game, assuming you're actually making progress in anything, you'll likely have found out the purpose of most of these resources, and will hopefully be earning a decent amount of them each month. Energy credits. Public credits! Essentially the ducats of both yours and the galaxy's economy. Your armies, your fleets, and pretty much everything you construct requires energy credits as upkeep. Buying and selling resources and slaves on the galactic trade market is also done directly with energy credits. They're essentially your core resource, your robux basically, as without credits both expansion, economic development, and maintaining territorial integrity would be near impossible. You also have civilian goods and alloys. Civilian goods are similar to energy credits in the sense that they're an upkeep sort of resource, constantly being consumed with increasing quantity as the game progresses. Just like humans in real life, funny alien people in the funny space game need their bam bam and TikTok to keep from rioting and looting in the streets. The sole purpose of civilian goods is keeping your civilization's population happy, and has no real function outside of population usage, and being used as an input for certain buildings, which I'll talk about more in a minute. On the flip side of things, there are alloys, an extremely vital resource in construction and the most important component in shipbuilding. The construction and upgrading of your space stations and their modules will always be done exclusively through alloys, as well as pretty much every type of megastructure unlocked and found within later stages of the game. But most importantly, alloys are the core and in some cases the only resource used in the construction of your civilization's ships, both civilian and critically military. The speed and quantity at which you're able to crank out fleets will be due in part to how many alloys you pull each month. So, it's generally a good rule of thumb to keep track and steadily increase the amount of alloys produced as the game progresses and where they'll be allocated to. However, I'd argue the most important resource in the game are minerals, because they are essential to properly maintaining a healthy industrial sector. Although a deficit of minerals is not as crippling as a credit deficit, it's still not something you want by any means. Minerals are the main resource for building buildings on planets and expanding districts on them as well. Buildings are well, just that, buildings, shocker. 
individual smaller structures that you can construct that intake one resource and output another as a result. Certain resources such as amenities, which produce a large happiness bonus on their respective planet, can only be acquired by constructing specific buildings such as hollow domes or gene clinics and much of the food that you produce will be grown in hydroponic farms. Planetary districts are also very important to further developing a planet. The types of districts that can be built vary from colony type, but generally there are five main types, residential, power, mining, industrial, and agricultural. Residential districts will provide large housing and small amenity bonuses to a planet, but siphon quite a bit from your credit production. Power, mining, and agricultural sectors will add a number of their respective resources to the planet's production catalog, with mining and agricultural ones requiring an upkeep in credits. And industrial sectors, which will take in minerals monthly, but will output both civilian goods and alloys. With the amount of diversity and combinations that exist between the districts and the many different buildings you can build, this leads to a plethora of different functions a planet can serve in the Empire, whether they be mining, farming, science administrative, or even fortress worlds. And speaking of worlds, planets exist. Planets literally exist in the space game, guys. Planets in Stellaris come in many different types. Terrestrial, gas and ice giant, barren, lush, frozen, blazing, uninhabited, and primitive. All of which can, or can potentially, provide the most precious commodity of all, living space. In Stellaris, people are a resource, and your population is not static, and it will constantly be growing and migrating so long as you remain in the game. This can be a problem. There's only so much much you can construct on a single planet. Eventually, worlds will become overpopulated, and without enough housing or resources and jobs to go around, people are going to get restless. Most of the time a revolution breaks out in Stellaris, it will be because a planet's population feels neglected, whether this is due to too few amenities, underdeveloped housing, or even a lack of employment. Colonization is the most long-term solution to this problem, so that way, when a pop, i.e. a unit of population, feels their needs aren't being met on one world, instead of revolting, they'll just simply migrate to a freshly inhabited, less populated world. Assuming they're allowed to on their own anyway. In the early game, your options for colonizing are somewhat limited. Obviously, your native population, whatever they may be, evolved to live on only a specific type of world, and the environment of that world will therefore be what your race is best suited to live on. So if your home world is a desert world, for example, desert exoplanets will provide the best habitability for your native species. And barren worlds, similar to Mars and gas giants, will be completely untouchable in the early game. Though later on, you can terraform them and even build like weird cloud city type colonies on gas giants meaning that your first initial colonies, though still helpful, will likely be established on harsher, more foreign worlds, even if you're lucky enough to snag a few perfectly compatible ones as well. However, the most interesting planets are hands down the primitive worlds. Primitive worlds are exactly what they sound like, planets that are inhabited by a native population that hasn't yet discovered FTL technology. The technical levels of these worlds can vary from the Stone Age up into pre-FTL Space Age, with technological progression being constant as the game progresses. So a primitive planet could start off the game with gunpowder level age of technology, but after 100 or even 200 years, it could ascend to FTL level awareness. And when this happens, this newly born civilization will break away from your own, and you'll have to make a decision if this occurs. Do you offer them vassalage in exchange for protection? Do you just let them stay independent as an unimportant minor enclave in the middle of space? Or do you invade them and forcibly bring their people into your fold? It all really depends on your playstyle and what you imagine your own civilization to actually be like, and how you believe they'd realistically respond. Luckily, that won't likely be something you'll have to actually worry about until later, and you can instead in the meantime just passively, or aggressively, observe them from space and use them as a farm for research points, and also optionally protect them from devastating asteroid impacts, while simultaneously hoping they don't go extinct in a nuclear war. Or you could just straight up pull Half-Life and just 7-hour war them while they're still permanent. That's also very valid, and it's pretty fun, too. Everything I've mentioned thus far is what the early game Stellaris is largely made of, and it can be quite chaotic at times, but also at times very fun. It is essentially an adrenaline-fueled rush to grab empty swaths of territory and explore as far out as you possibly can to try and secure as great an initial position as you possibly can. Even if your empire in-game is unaware of it, you, the player, know that there are other civilizations out there in the void, 
expanding and colonizing as frantically as you are. But all you can really do is just continue to expand. That is, of course, until you finally encounter one. The initial discovery of another civilization is always a bit jarring. Your science ships, while routinely surveying star system, will detect something anomalous, an unknown frequency. It appears that a completely foreign vessel is present in the system with them. However, unable to do much apart from proceed with their usual tasks, all they can really do is report the encounter to you and continue to survey. Maybe they detect the signal again, or maybe they don't. But once a couple more years of pushing deeper into space go by, they'll detect something else. Not just a single straggling signal, but a large energy reading present in the system they found themselves in. It isn't a ship, and it isn't coming from a star. It's the first sign of intelligent life. A space station orbiting in an uncharted system. The civilization you've discovered won't pop up on the map instantly. Instead, you'll have to spend an indefinite amount of time wondering what and who exactly they are. The only possible markings of what could possibly be their territory being the signatures they've let travel through the vacuum. What they look like, what they call themselves, how friendly they are, all of it is left a mystery until they finally show themselves to you. Even after they show themselves, however, there's still much mystery surrounding them. One thing Stellaris pulls off very well in the early game is the fog of war. You don't get to see the full extent of this civilization's territory, nor do you get to gauge the power of their navy or their extent of technological progression. You can't even really know for certain if they might attack you in an effort to expand further. All you get is a portrait and a few bordering systems, but what is for certain is that their pocket of space is cut off to you so it'd be wise to focus expanding elsewhere, which will hence lead to a faster exploration of fewer hyperlane chains, until, inevitably, you find another alien civilization, and another, and another, until finally, a local neighborhood of empires is established. It's at this stage that expansion will greatly slow down, and you'll begin to shift your focus mostly to your interior, developing your economy, colonizing more worlds outside of your core group of planets, and hastily fortifying your suddenly newly established borders. And it's at this point the first wars you'll fight will break out. Now, early game wars in Stellaris hit different. Keep in mind, these wars will occur long before you've researched a good amount of military tech, so your naval capacity will likely be relatively small, only allowing for the creation of maybe two or three fully powered fleets, which themselves will be of a small fleet size limit. And on top of that, they'll likely be made up largely of corvettes, with possibly some frigates strewn about if you're lucky enough to have researched those by then. In fact, at this point in the game, star bases may be more powerful than an entire fleet if they're decked out with weapon modules, and accompanied by a complement of defense platforms. Whereas in the late game, one side will typically eventually overpower and push into another, early game wars can be very slow paced and run on for years on end, and instead of a crushing victory, many of them tend to fizzle out in borderline stalemates with the minimal gains. Despite that though, there are usually plenty of good reasons to launch these primitive wars against your neighbors. One of the most obvious of course being to try and limit the power of potential future enemies. This is especially the case if they happen to control a particularly well positioned choke point system that may be a pain to break through later on in the future, or if you happen to know they hold a slight advantage in resources that you can't allow to be exploited. If you do decide that a war is necessary to wage in this stage of the game, it's best to try and get it out of the way as early as possible, as once you have the privilege, or perhaps misfortune, of encountering enough alien civilizations, the first major galactic-wide event will finally kick off, the formation of the galactic community. And once that happens, you can expect defense packs and even federations to start to form. And this is where a game of Stellaris really begins to heat up, as you and your neighbors make a final transition from being a collection of regional powers floating in empty space, to being a part of a galaxy-spanning game of politics and grand strategy. I often say to my friends that a game of Stellaris brings out either the worst or best qualities of a person. Better than any CIA interrogation methods, 
playing this game reveals a person's true character. Kind of like how in Yu-Gi-Oh! the Millennium Ankh reveals your inner Ka, Stellaris reveals your inner historical figure. And the longest stretch of Stellaris, its middle game, is where this inner character rears its head. You'll either be a Gandhi or a Hitler, Maybe something in between, like a John Adams. And while this is regrettable to say, I can't lie to you, being Hitler is fun. I'm still waiting on the final solution expansion for Hoi 4 by the way paradox. Being that this is the point of the game where politics and managing your interior to keep on par with your neighbors becomes more important than ever, this is the time where deciding your domestic policies and finalizing your approach to other alien species will matter the most. Of course, there are as many different directions the game can go from here as there are people who ever make it this far into a Stellaris game. But there are trends. For people who hate fun, their ultimate goal may be to form some sort of grand alliance of like-minded states. Carving out a strong grasp on galactic politics by way of a strong federation, or by heading a rallying effort of other empires to your side and gaining their support for xenophilic and egalitarian causes. Essentially, cementing yourself in a place of power without necessarily doing so through coercion and warfare. And if that sounds interesting at all, well, I bet you're real fun at parties, huh? Look guys, this isn't Crusader Kings, where patience and scheming is rewarding. This is Stellaris, a game where entire planets represent the smallest scale of management, and where it can take a few in-game years to research even a single bit of tech. The developers didn't give me this awesome ship designer or the option to mass-produce clone armies just to sign non-aggression packs. I want to officially state now that no action I take in regard to this video game at all represents my real-life personal beliefs or ideologies. All humor aside, really the best way to keep your stability and security healthy in the long term is to go full 1984. In terms of diplomacy, outside of espionage activity, there's basically not much you really need to do. So much as just needing to keep as much much of your economy centered around the military industrial complex as possible. Because from this point forward, basically everyone around you is probably going to hate you. A lot. People are probably going to be sanctioning you for the monster you'll become. But if you dedicated a lot of your time in the early game building up your navy and developing your dockyards, you'll probably be in a good spot to rapidly expand by the time you reach the mid game. Remember that the sooner you hit your neighbors hard, the less likely they'll be a threat to you later. There are a multitude of ways to actually wage a war in Stellaris at this point. I think the ideal way for most people to go about one is to mix the usage of naval and ground forces, blasting away fleets and securing large swaths of space just to make way for army invasions on enemy colonies and grand, swift, and decisive campaigns. And while those may work for some people, you have to remember something. I don't conquer for glory and waging historic battles. I conquer for living space and security. I'm less of a Napoleon and more of a Sherman. Typically a war against another large power in Stellaris isn't clean or swift for me. They tend to be slow, surgical, and most importantly, scorching. Typically an initial first priority will be the strategic entrapment and destruction of enemy fleets, lulling them into unoccupied territory and subsequently pouncing on them. Ideally, within the time of only a handful of battles, their navy will be a shadow of its former self. Giving them any moment of respite is a big no-no. If I have the means to manage so, I'll usually dedicate one or two of my fleets to chasing down and continually battling their battered fleets. Otherwise, the entirety of my naval capacity will be dedicated to securing starports and other vital strategic points like, say, ancient megastructures all along the boundaries of my claimed territory and doggedly defending them at all costs. These strategic points serving as the front lines of combat while I, well, work on things behind the lines. What kind of work do I mean exactly? Well, when you successfully occupy a star system in Stellaris, if an enemy colony or colonies happen to be in it, they don't automatically flip to your side. This is where your armies will come into play. Now, unless you're landing multiple armies or have one with a strength level in the thousands, it's typically not a good idea to just invade planets as soon as possible. Possible. Planets have garrisons, and the more developed a planet, the larger its garrison will be. And if one happens to have fortresses built on it, its garrison strength is greatly boosted on top of having a massively elevated defensive bonus. The only way to secure a planet with as minimal losses as possible is to bombard the shit out of them. There are a few different methods of going about orbital bombardment, selective and indiscriminate bombing being the two most common. The main purpose of these forms being to first and foremost damage enemy armies and lower the morale of the defenders until they surrender. But these are a bit too 
inefficient for my taste. Armageddon bombing is my go-to option for securing a planet. It not only does the most damage to armies at a staggering 200%, it also does the most damage to the planet's buildings and its population. Also, unlike the other bombardment types, if you kill a colony's entire population with this method, the world is turned into a lifeless tomb world, and will need to be terraformed to be re-inhabited. But with worlds within my claimed territory, my intent isn't so much destruction, so much as it is cleansing, and colonization efforts of my own. So I tend to let a few of the native pops live and then land my armies, just so I don't need to wait for years and years to terraform a desolate world. Rinse and repeat until every enemy planet is taken. So I've done it, right? I've won the war. I've taken all the worlds that needed to be taken, and I've occupied every one of my claimed star systems. Well, not quite. It's not very common in Stellaris to annex a power all at once. It typically takes a few wars to do so. So the best way to ensure that your opponent can't recover by the time you declare war on them again is to burn what remains of them to the fucking ground. If I haven't already taken them as part of my war goals, capital and administrative worlds are always a primary target for what I call glassing campaigns. As you can probably guess from the name alone, the main goal of these campaigns is purely destruction. Glassing as many enemy colonies as possible until I just want to make peace that badly. Ideally, by the conclusion of a war with me, a large chunk of an enemy's territory has been stolen, their resources are sapped, their economy ruined, and their population slashed to a meager fraction of what it originally was. Like I told you before, scorching. Be sure to rinse and repeat until you no longer feel threatened by the people on your borders. Warfare, however, is not the only factor in ruling over an Orwellian or, uh, I mean, well lubricated space empire. Managing your own population is a huge part in keeping the peace. More specifically, letting your native population enjoy the best your government has to offer at the top of the social hierarchy, while also enslaving everything else with a pulse inside your borders. Maybe even disposing of the larger enslaved groups because they may be too threatening to keep around. In this regard, the developers of Stellaris are honestly quite ballsy, because genocide is not just a flat option. In fact, there are a multitude of methods to wage entire genocide campaigns against aliens, and some are more devious than others. In order to, put politely, lower the population of a certain alien race, you need to first set their status in the Empire as undesirable. Once this is set, you select the species purge type. Displacement, neutering, and necrophage are the three most, uh, merciful, I guess. Displacement and neutering are the two most self-explanatory, I'm sure. The former is basically just forcing them out of your territory and into your neighbors, while the latter is just making sure they can't produce any more of their relative pops on any of your colonies. In neither case is anyone actually dying, although the people bordering you are probably going to get really pissed off for the refugee crisis you've caused if you choose displacement. Necrophage is the most unique of the non-lethal options, as it literally turns the undesired species into your native species, although you can only do this if your race has a necrophage origin. But purges aren't really all too fun if they're non-lethal, right? And this, my friends, is where the real fun begins. Forced labor, chemical processing, and processing. All of which have a monthly pop decline of 50. Forced labor is a classic, of course, presumably sending the species in question into the mines and onto the farms. This option gives a respectable plus three minerals and plus three food per pop until the unit is killed assumably killed in a gory agricultural accident or by a heart attack after hearing a Minecraft cave sound. Chemical processing and processing are where things get a bit disturbing. In the words of Stellaris itself, they will soon attain a more efficient form. Both of these purge types literally involve the euthanizing and, well, processing of their bodies into a particular resource. With chemical processing, all pops involved produce plus six energy credits. And with standard processing, it depends on the species of the pot being purged. Organic life forms give plus six food, lithoids plus four minerals, and robots plus three alloys. And yeah, backbreaking slave labor is cool and all, but this screams Spanish Peru, or like Portuguese Brazil. Murderous, yes. Genocidal, mm, I'm not too sure about that. I was promised Auschwitz in space, and instead you're giving me 17th century Hispaniola. Well, hold that thought. There is one last purge option that hasn't been covered yet. Extermination. This certainly is the most effective, but 
also most contentious of all the purge options, with a lethality rate of 100 pops per month, but with a happiness penalty of minus 1000%. Not to mention the fact that in most games it tends to be outlawed by the galactic community. If the species you're attempting to exterminate is large enough, it will lead to violence possibly even to a rebellion. The best way to avoid any serious resistance is to keep the species in question spread out across your territory, and to use the species migration controls very liberally, transporting clumps of them off to different worlds in regular rotations. Soon enough, any possibility of them fighting back will be dashed, as their population continues to decline with increasing efficiency, the pops that survive escaping into other empires. But purging, as efficient of a solution as it may be, is not always the most efficient one. One problem with this type of playthrough, that being a closed border xenophobic civilization, is how low your population will be in comparison to other more open civilizations. Whereas a democratic and xenophilic empire may have a population as high as a thousand pops later into the mid-game, an empire like mine may have a bit over 300 native pops, close to 500 maybe if I happen to get really lucky with colonization, or make an effort to terraform a ton of otherwise unprofitable worlds. Point is, relying solely on your dominant species is not a very practical thing to do for its own set of reasons. If the end results of my campaigns of destruction against other civilizations has taught me one thing, underpopulation can be a very serious, very crippling issue. Namely, in regard to long-term inferior resource production and a lack of scientific progression. What's the solution to that? Indentured servitude. Now, slaves, they may not literally even be human or whatever the hell this is, but that doesn't mean they don't have some use. The main use being to shore up whatever you lack in manpower in pretty much any area of your empire where said manpower is needed. Like purge types, there are plenty of slavery types to choose from for an enslaved species, but the only two you'll probably ever really need are chattel slavery and battle thralls. I, I, don't, I don't even know what this says. Battle thralls are a bit situational. As the game says, they're essentially weaponized serfs. Thralls can fulfill jobs such as police officers, duelists, which produce amenities if your empire has a warrior culture, and they can also fight in what are essentially cheap and expendable slave armies with a 20% damage bonus to enemy armies, but with a 20% happiness debuff. Not as good as clone armies, but they're alright if you don't want to use your own native population as soldiers. Chattel slaves, however, are probably the type of slave you'll most often use. They serve no purpose other than taking the dirty low-class jobs like mining, farming, and working in factories, with a 10% productivity bonus on top of whatever it is their enslaved species can pull in by default. And, the best part, they have no political representation, duh. So there's no risk in them influencing your government type and your civilization's values. But it also comes at a steep minus 30% happiness debuff. If you're like me and you set the default species rights to chattel slavery, this can potentially be bad news. If you have hundreds of angry pops, possibly an amount of angry pops that outnumber your happy native pops, mass sweeping revolts are very much a possibility. It's simple math, right? There's five of us and only one guy over there with an electro staff. We should murder him. There is, however, one good solution to this problem. Slave colonies. That's not an actual type of world in the game. That's just like something that I just started doing on my own. Worlds stuffed to the brim with enslaved pops, possibly up into the hundreds that have no housing and no amenities, just filled up with industry districts and work-related buildings, serving no purpose but to hold your excess slave populations and produce a ton of resources. Slap a couple fortresses down and build some orbital architecture to increase security and productivity, and boom, the ideal forced labor planet. Typically, I'll try to have at least one slave colony per sector, or two if the population of the sector is high enough to warrant it. It's probably worth mentioning that while this is a pretty decent way of minimizing security risk and maximizing productivity, it's not foolproof. It's more of a strategy intended primarily for containing slave results and not outright preventing them. If they're not monitored well, a slave colony can easily burst into a full-fledged rebellion sometimes bringing neighboring systems into the fold with them. And these rebellions can get complicated, sometimes forming alliances with your rivals or just straight up letting themselves be incorporated into someone else's territory. So it's important to keep a semi-powerful fleet somewhere close by your slave systems just to keep at the ready for a possible revolution. And in true imperial fashion, it's important to teach those traitors a very long-remembered lesson. There are times when I'll bombard an ungrateful revolting slave colony until its population dips from, say, 
100, all the way down to just roughly around 10. In my own head canon, one pop is worth a billion beings. So that's 90 billion slaves killed in a single bombing campaign. It is of no concern though, of course. I get to both crush a rebellious population and teach the survivors a lesson they'll pass on to their grandchildren, thus beginning a new era of peace for the people. In the Legends canon of Star Wars, the objectively superior Star Wars universe by the way, there's a species known as the Yuzhan Vong. Almost entirely on their own, they managed to conquer large swaths of the galaxy, nearly destroying the New Republic in the process. Extragalactic in origin, the Yuzhan Vong wielded a wide array of superior weaponry that could hardly be countered by the likes of any known capital ship. Only by banding together, a galaxy-wide coalition of New Republic, Imperial, and Independent worlds were just barely able to prevail over the merciless Yuzhan Horde. This Pyrrhic victory, however, came at the cost of over 300 trillion combined lives across every species of being in the galaxy. A collapsed galactic economy, and thousands of planets being utterly annihilated. I suppose you could say it was a crisis of sorts. And with that, we reach the endgame, Galaxy Crises. It's probably worth noting that by using Unity, the player can select specific Ascension perks that allow themselves to become the Crisis. But I won't be talking about that, as aside from the whole Star Eater thing, it's not really as crazy as it sounds. It's basically just you becoming Nazi Germany in space. Or, well, in my case, more of a Nazi Germany in space. There are many different factors that actually go into an endgame crisis spawning in Stellaris, and honestly, I can't even name what all of them are. The most important criteria for any of them, however, is that you've reached 25 years after the endgame pop-up. By default, the endgame year is set to 2500, though I hear a lot of players like to set it to 2400. There are three main types of endgame level crises, Prothoran, Extra Dimensional, and Contingency. Prothoran in particular is quite similar to that bit of Star Wars lore I shared earlier. The Prothoran Scourge are a weird, psychic, tentacle monster-like species whose origins are extragalactic in nature. This is the crises with the slowest burn to it. It'll start off very innocuous in nature, if a bit strange, with the detection of subspace whispers long off outside the boundaries of the galactic disk. It'll only be about 50 years after these faint whispers that the Scourge will finally arrive at the doorstep of the galaxy, annexing a number of preset star systems along the outer rim with a dozen powerful fleets. But that is only the Vanguard. Only about a year after that, another even larger and more powerful wave of invasion forces will arrive. Their might focused onto swarming into and conquering as much territory as possible. But even before the proper invasion, the galactic community will have already made fighting the Scourge a top and unifying priority. While doable, fighting the Scourge is a taxing job. Any planet they touch will become infested with their species, and can only be taken back by having their surfaces glassed. And so long as they control territory in the galaxy, they'll continue to rapidly build up their fleets made from powerful and strange organic ships. And it's understandable to assume there's a point of no return with their invasion. A point where they become so powerful that defeating them becomes seemingly impossible. However, even if they happen to get the better of you, there's still one last hope. If the Scourge happen to secure 15% of the galaxy, a sort of counter-crisis will spawn. The Sentinel Order, a mysterious, powerful NPC faction whose main goal is to fight off the Scourge. If the Scourge happen to secure 50% of the galaxy, the Sentinels, as well as all surviving empires, will have a 20% damage bonus given to them against Scourge ships. One final hurrah, I guess. And once you've finally eventually beaten them back, you can't help but ask, at what cost? Dozens of habitable worlds will have been destroyed, entire civilizations will have been wiped out, the entire galactic economy is ruined, the galaxy has been ravaged, but thankfully not destroyed, and it will be rebuilt. The next crisis type, Extra Dimensional Invaders, is not as interesting as it sounds. 
While it is still fun, I feel like it's maybe a bit tamer than the name would have you believe. The crisis begins with a sudden, immeasurable power surge in a random location in the galaxy. That sudden surge was the result of a portal that has manifested out of nowhere destroying any star bases in the system it appeared in, and emerging from out of said portal, a massive, powerful fleet commanded by mystical beings known as the Unbidden. This is the only one of the crises that will spawn spontaneously. Fifteen days after the initial fleet, another powerful fleet will appear from that portal. In 15 days after that, another fleet. And for the next two years, fleets wielding unspeakable power and might will continue to spawn at random intervals, with a maximum fleet limit of 2,000 ships. Similarly to the Scourge, the galactic community will try to unify itself against this existential threat. Unlike the Scourge, the Unbidden have only one point of entry into the galaxy, their portal of origin. Destroy the portal, and the Unbidden will quickly wither away. In order to destroy this portal, a number of portal anchors that also spawn in randomly must be destroyed first. Going back to Star Wars for a moment, the battle for the portal reminds me a lot of the battle over Endor. In order to destroy this portal, you'll likely be throwing every single ship you have into the fray. The Unbidden will do the exact same thing. If a hostile fleet is detected in the portal system, every fleet they control will be recalled to defend it. It's an all or nothing affair, victory or death. What I find most interesting about this crisis, however, are the two other interdimensional species that will spawn into the galaxy as well. If the Unbidden manage to conquer at least 15% of the galaxy, it will lead to another portal opening up somewhere, spawning in fleets controlled by the Aberrant, and a few years after that, the Vehement will spawn in much the same fashion. Both races are mechanically similar to the Unbidden and will also be hostile to all empires in the galaxy, but they're also hostile to one another, so it's like a massive civil war going on amidst this invasion of the galaxy. And it can be pretty fun and chaotic, not gonna lie. Though interdimensional fleets are insanely powerful, they have one very crippling weakness. Their ships have almost no armor at all, but are very heavily shielded. So, the best way to fight these invaders is luring them into pulsar star systems where their shielding is nullified. It's very much like melting down steel. And speaking of steel, we've reached the last endgame event, and this is probably the most interesting of them all, the Contingency. Basically Terminator in space. This crisis is pretty much my main justification for why I don't produce androids and keep only biological slaves. The crisis starts off with a small event, a mysterious ghost signal that bounces across the galaxy from empire to empire, and over the next several years, a number of events will kick off for every empire still in the game that involve the mysterious disappearance of robotic pops, all while the strange enigmatic signal continues to grow in strength until suddenly, uninhabitable worlds will suddenly start to become colonized by robots, turning them into sterilization AI hub worlds with a complementary defense fleet and strong space stations spawning in with them. These detached enclaves will then strike out against their neighbors in an effort to connect to one another to form a vast, continuous empire. It'll be at this point the galactic community will do its thing and form a union against the rogue machines. The rogue AI, however, are not just on a warpath. They're out to purge the galaxy of all living things. When a colony falls to the contingency, its pops are immediately purged, organics and synthetics alike. Many will even be transferred to the sterilization hubs, so even if a colony is retaken quickly, its population will be devastated regardless. Along with battles in space and on colonies on the front lines, troubles will also occur on the home front. Synths will try and infiltrate all aspects of the empires they battle, bombing buildings, scuttling spaceports, assassinating politicians, scientists, and military heads. As a huge fan of the Terminator films, this crisis really interests me, and it's probably my favorite one. And much like how Skynet has a central core that controls all of the actions of its war effort, the contingency can only be beaten by destroying all of its sterilization hubs. This in turn will reveal a hidden star system at the fringe ends of galactic space, containing a fifth and final AI planet named Nexus-01, the origin point of the ghost signal and guarded by several insanely powerful AI space stations. If you manage to defeat them, the ghost signals will immediately disappear and all contingency fleets will self-destruct. Again, this crisis is a very good example of why you really shouldn't use robotic pops. Regardless of whichever crisis you and your unconventional allies end up facing, one thing will be for certain. The galaxy will have been burnt. Either in part, or possibly even in large part. If you're lucky, you'll have been untouched by the Hellfire, or at least have had a speedy recovery. 
Now, you could decide to mark your survival of the crisis as an endpoint to the game, or you could keep going a bit further, using the galaxy's raising as an opportunity to pull one final amazing stunt. This could be an opportunity to do something great. Maybe as a brand new head of the Galactic Council, you could use the lessons learned from this great war to build a grand future for all beings in the galaxy. A future where there is peace, justice, and security for all who wish to live in fairness. Or instead I could rush in and take over all the burnt and ruined territory. More slaves, more credits, the crisis was the best thing that ever happened in galactic history. No one can stand up to me. 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100, best king, best king.